I just love you. I'm going to be with you when you go up yonder. Yes. To be with the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Well, I am just excited. You may be seated. Um, and I do give honor to our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. All that he does, all that he has done, all that he will do. And also to the angels of this house. Pastors, Randall and Ferdinand Hall Walker. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God for you and the work that you are doing here in the city of Charlotte. Um, she is some songstress in her right. Um, an artist. None is par excellent. You are. And I thank God that I have met and that our path have crossed. I really, really do. Amen. So I thank God for the invitation uh, to have life change and come uh, to celebrate the second year anniversary. And I thank God for it, for you. Because if you make it one year in ministry, something to celebrate amen so we thank God for the two years that you have been giving God glory and praise amen and of course I thank life changing for you coming out today I praise God for you I love you so much and I appreciate you as well and to all of our officers, all of our ministers, would you just raise your hand, all the ministers that came from Life Changing. Amen. Praise God for you and for our deacons, our deacons who came. Thank God for you who are here today. Praise God for you. And last but certainly not least. <laughs> A man that is man that the Lord has given me in the, as a gift. He is certainly a gift to me. He's a present, if you will. And I thank God for him. And I don't have to sit here and say it just to make it sound good. Because if you were in our home, you would see him treat me this way in my house in my car, in the supermarket, uh, truly a man of God who I know loves me. And guess what? I love him too. Amen. Amen. You have to let the person that the Lord gives you as a present know that you care about them and that you love them. Am I right about it? You don't tell them somebody will. Might as well be you. Amen. Praise God. Amen. But again, I am excited about this great occasion. And so today I came and I want to stay in keeping with your theme, moving to the next level. I do believe that when a pastor takes the time to send a theme and scripture that one needs to stay within that. And so I am going to ask um, Elder Harrison, she has a mic, amen. If you would read Ephesians, the third chapter, the 20th and the 21st verse, please. Ephesians chapter three, verses 20 and 21. And I'm reading from the New King James and it reads, now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus, to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Father, I do bless you today. And I thank you for another opportunity to stand before your people. God, I thank you for this opportunity. 
word. God, I thank you for this text, God. I thank you for the man and woman of God who thought it not robbery to invite us into this house. Now, God, I ask that you would decrease me so that nothing is seen except your word. God, I ask right now that the ears will open, that they can hear your word. And then I ask that behaviors would come to a place where they would be doers of the word, not just hearers of the word, God. And I bless you right now for it. I ask that you take me through, God. I ask that you hide me, God. I ask, God, that you would touch my body right now in the name of Jesus. We rebuke anything that would try to hinder this word from going forth. And we bless you right now in the name of Jesus. Let God's people shout amen. 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 I love this particular scripture because what it does is it encourages it lets us know that God is able amen and so I want to talk to you for a little bit about get positioned uh, for the next level and then I have a question for you and the question is are you ready yes I'm ready see it's easy to talk about getting going there but there's some preparation to get to the next level and, and so I ask that question, are you ready to move to that level? Amen? Amen. So I ask the question, how many of you are tired of being in the same old position? Yes, yes. Same old hoo-ha, the same rut in life. Many of you get tired of the same thing. Every morning you get up, you have the same cereal. You have the same hard-boiled egg. You have the same piece of toast. You have the same coffee. And then the next morning you do the same routine. And after a while you want to see something different. Amen? Amen. And so sometimes we just get tired of being in the same old position. But the only one that can make that change is you. <laughs> Nobody else can make a change in your life but you. Amen. And so there are natural and spiritual levels in our lives. And uh, that can be enhanced if you really want to put the time in to accomplish it. In order to make changes, you have to put time in. In order to make changes, you have to really want to make a change. Um, nothing worth having comes without work. I'm sure that we have all had to put some time in to get to some of the places we are right now. Which is why we say, devil, you can't have what I got. Because I had to put time in to get it. Amen? And so, many of us hear the statement, I'm moving into the next level. But many of us have no idea. <laughs> you have no idea what the next level will cost us. In the form of sacrifice, oh my, and struggle. So somebody, some sacrifice comes when you move to a next level. Now if you want to move an inch away, you might be able to do that without some struggle. But when you're talking about going to levels, uh, there's got to be some sacrifice in that. Advancement causes significant sacrifice. That's why when you go to college, you sacrifice four years of your life so that you can have a better life. Amen? Amen. That's good. So that's why we tell our young people, do something with your life. Hallelujah. The only thing that can prevent you from having a significant life is you. So Jesus moved through so many levels in his life and he ended up making the ultimate sacrifice on the cross till somebody cost him something. And so moving to the next level of our spiritual lives is where we all want or need to be. So nobody in their right mind wants to stay right where they are without any hope 
of moving to a higher position in Christ. And if we are no further along now than you were a year ago, two years ago, or five years ago, if you're still doing the same thing that you were doing two years ago, three years ago, and no advancement has been made in Christ Jesus, then time has moved on without you. And there's an old cliche that says, if you keep doing what you've always done, you'll keep getting what you've always got. You can't expect change when you're not making a change. Amen. And so you must move in order to see change. You can't stay in the same place and expect change. Am I right about that? So change is not change until we change. In order to move, we must get divinely positioned. Tell somebody divinely. divinely. We must be forward thinkers and not backward thinkers. Some of us don't want to think going forward. We just want to either stay in the same place or we're thinking back. Uh, well, we used to do it this way. Well, come on, watch out now. Well, 10 years ago, they did it this way. Uh, Mama and them did it like this. And so that's a backward thinker. Forward thinking means that we are going to move in another direction. But we're going to try something different. And if it don't work, we'll try something else. But you can't stay in the same old place all the time and expect something good to occur. So, for Proverbs, the 23rd chapter, the 7th verse says, For as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So if you think you can't make it, if you think you can't do it, then guess what? You won't do it. That's why so many of you are sitting out here right now. You missed your millionaire stage. Why? Because you didn't want to move. You were afraid to get up and take that next level chance. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God wants to enlarge our territory. But he can't if we're not willing to move. We'll sit still and complain, but we're not willing to move. We want things different, but we're not willing to do anything to make it different. The next level is yours for the asking. Let me have some water, please. It is yours for the asking. All you have to do is position yourself uh -huh. to receive from the Lord. You got to tell your partner next to you, check your posture. Positioning. How you're positioned means everything. Positioning means there is a certain posture to receive certain favor. Ah, uh, you want favor from the Lord, but you got to be divinely connected. And you've got to be in a position to receive that favor. See, your posture will determine how others see you. If you're walking with your head down all the time, folk are going to see you with your head down. And they'll probably say, poor Joe. But if you're walking with your head up, you may not have a dime in your pocket. But they don't have to know that you're broke. Hallelujah. It's your posture. It's your posture. And so, how you posture yourself in God's presence will determine if you get God's attention. Do you have a posture of praise? Do you have a posture of worship? When you come into the house of God, do you come in ready to praise with your hands up? Hallelujah. The pastor Walker have to pump you and pry you to get up and give God some praise? Do you have to sing 10 songs before you get it? Are you in a posture of praising God just because he let you walk through 
to the door. Are you in a posture of praise? Just because you had two eggs to eat that morning, your praise should already be on your lips when you walk in the door. If the praise team that was to sing one song, you ought to make all the noise by yourself. Somebody ought to tell you you got to sit down because you are so grateful. your worship that when you just think of the goodness of Jesus when you just think how he kept you all night long when you just think how he let you get to church and your hoop did it didn't break down when you think about his goodness there ought to be a posture of worship you ought to just wave your hand and say Lord I worship you just because of who you are. Y'all trying to make me preach. Hallelujah. I got a little challenge going on up here. But I, I believe God today. Because there's a word that you need to hear. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory. So here in our text. Paul has written an epistle to the Ephesians where he anchors his thoughts around the church of our Lord Jesus Christ. In this epistle, he noticed that the first three chapters deal with the beliefs and the doctrines surrounding the church. While in the fourth and through the sixth verses deal with the behavior and how to maintain our unity as a church. This is next level. Four through six is next level. So in chapter number three, verse 20, which is your text, Paul gives a doxology to the church, which is a prayer and expression of praise to God. And it says, now, meaning present, unto him, Talking about our Savior. And that is able. That's where you get your hope. To do exceeding. Not just mediocre. Ah, but exceeding. Abundant. That means a whole bunch. Above all that we can ask or think. Oh, don't you know your lips don't have enough to ask for what you can do? Your little mind cannot grasp what he can think about what God can do. Hallelujah. According to the power that worketh in us. So, McGuire, you're saying power that worketh in us. Well, so what is this power that is at work in us? Uh, you ought to feel real good about yourself. You got some power in you. Right now, you ought to just sit back and pull your chest back because there's a power working in you. You ought to point to yourself the power that working in me. Oh, this power. It is the power of the living God that raised Christ from the dead. And by that power, he is able to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think because God is at work in the lives of his children and we are his children. Tell somebody, he's at work in me. And, and so if we are his children of God, we need to exercise our faith, believing that he is able to do all things. You can't know this if you don't have faith. You've got to put some faith to work in order to get this power to work. You got it in you, baby. All you got to do is work it. Tell somebody, work it, work it, work it. Thank <laughs> you. 
to do all things. Not some. All things. He's able. Tell yourself he's able. Somebody came in here today in doubt. Wondering whether or not God was going to open that door you asked him for. Well, let me tell you he's able. Let me tell you, don't you leave here. Wondering whether or not he can do it. He's able. Hallelujah. And if he doesn't do it, it's because he didn't want to do it. And he's working it for your good. Hallelujah. Now, now, with this in mind, I have two questions to ask you, freedom, worship, and life changing. Number one, are you really ready for the next level? Because in order to get to the next level, there must be some serious faith exercise. I don't mean some little faith. I'm talking about some serious faith. I'm talking about some faith that you know if, not, if it doesn't get done. Ah, only God can do this. This is going to be God's eyes. Ah, serious faith. is because for he that cometh to God must not should you must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him he's a rewarder you all he is a rewarder he will reward us just for diligently seeking Him. Who would deserve God like that? Just to seek Him. He's a reward. Tell somebody I'm headed to the next level. Question number two is what does a next level church look like? We want to go to the next level. Well, we need to know what you're going to look like when you get there. Am I right about it? Uh huh. Uh, uh, the next level church is going to offer us a great challenge. In essence, to Suggests that there is a next implies that God is not through with us yet. So by freedom saying we're headed to the next level, that means you got a whole lot of good stuff ahead of you. That means he ain't through with you yet, brother. That means he's getting ready to take you somewhere. Hallelujah. And don't you stop moving. On an elevator. Don't you get off till he tell you to get off. If it stops on the 13th floor and you're supposed to go to the 15th, don't you dare get off. It implies that we might have hit a challenging place in our pilgrimage. But because we are associated and connected to an awesome God, you and I are privileged to participate 
in another move of God. Tell somebody next move. Next move. We need to understand that when we talk about moving to the next level, that the power to engage in the next level ministry, it will not come from us. That's good. Got it. You won't take credit for this. All right. All right now. That's good. It's not going to come from your deacon. It's not going to come from your pastor. It's not going to come from the musician. You can't take credit for it. Because it's going to come solely from God. And I'm of the opinion that no one can move from one level to another level until God empowers to release it. I don't care how much money you got in the bank. I don't care how many days you get to do it. Until God releases it, they can get mad with you. But until God releases the time, it will not happen. Yeah. That's right. Mm. I believe that. Mm. I had to, that. That dealt with me. Yeah. When I did this message, that dealt with me. Because I had to take a step back and say, oh. Yeah. Yeah. Uh oh. Yeah. It don't happen. You're not getting nothing till I release it. Yeah. I'm going to release the job. Salvation in your house. You can pray all you want to, but he ain't or she ain't getting saved till God releases it. You better understand how God moves. He doesn't move in our time. He didn't say he wouldn't save them, but he's gonna save them when he's ready to save. else I said today God empowers his people then he releases why would he give you something and you can't handle it he's going to empower us this is why Paul says in our text now unto him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. So he empowers us so that the power can work through. So what does the next level church look like? It's a church that recognizes they have been chosen by God. Not every church has been chosen by God. But no, 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 no. Don't you, don't you fool yourself. Not every church. It takes some struggles to get here. Every time I hear a church story about a struggle, I think, yeah, God put you there. Yeah. Struggle. Sometimes you have to struggle in this thing. But you are a chosen race. 1 Peter 2 and 9 says, but you are a chosen race. You are a royal priesthood. We're talking about what the next level church looks like. You are a holy nation. Mm. You are peculiar people. Folk well, don't understand you. They're not supposed to be able to relate to everything you do. Because you're a peculiar people. You don't sit in the break room at work and talk about the dirty jokes. You get up and leave. You are a peculiar people to the world. Oh, that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into the marvelous light. See, when God calls you out of darkness, you are happy about that thing. And you will stop somebody on the corner to tell them how good God's been. You will stop them in the supermarket and hold the line up like uh, Minister Burnett does to tell them how good God has been. You will stop them at the 
post office. Start telling them about how good God has been. Not only that, you find yourself telling stuff you didn't mean to tell. Start talking about what you used to do and how you used to do and where he brought you from. So that the person there will know that you were once like me. And if I did it for you, you'll do it for me. themselves about which one of them pastor 
What's going to be the greatest? In Luke, the 22nd chapter, uh, the 24th to the 30th verse, we find this story. And Luke, the physician, he is very candid and honest about the immaturity of the disciples. Yes, there is nothing worse than an immature disciple. There is nothing worse than a disciple who can't take a little bit of something. An immature disciple who has been in church 40 years and they're still having cornflakes and milk. Cyprus for augury. But listen, look at this. This argument, this conversation that they're having, it came on the heels of a wonderful spiritual experience. The Passover. It was a meal which Jesus himself had conducted. And here they are sitting, Elder Harrison, arguing about who was going to be the greatest. The only thing they can think of at a time like this and talk about and discuss is who is the greatest among them. Well, this is not next level ministry. We ought to not be sitting around wondering who is going to be the pastor's adjutant. We ought to not be wondering who's going to lead the next song in the choir. Shouldn't be wondering who's going to usher next Sunday. Shouldn't be wondering about who would be the assistant to the elect lady. We shouldn't be worrying about all of this nonsense. Why? Because it takes your focus off of ministry. My Bible says your gifts will make room for you. You ain't got to push nobody out of the way. You don't have to ask anybody to do anything because your gift will make room for you. I just saw a gift today that's going to make room for somebody. I didn't even know they had a gift. But now that I've seen a gift, it's going to make room for them. Jesus heard them arguing. Listen to his response. He didn't say to them, stop it, y'all sitting around arguing. He never said, come on, we have the time to go to the next level. But this is what he said. He said, the kings of the Gentiles dominate them and those who have authority over them are called benefactors. But it must not be like that, he said, among you. On the contrary, whoever is greatest among you must become like the youngest and whoever leads like the one serving. For who is greater, the one at the table or the one serving? Isn't it the one at the table? But I, talk about say, am among you as the one who serves. I am the greatest. I am who I am. There is nobody greater than me. I've searched all over. They couldn't find nobody. Nobody greater than me. That's Jesus said, but no greater than me. But you are arguing about who is going to be the greatest. There is no one greater. And the reason I use that adjective is because they walked with him. They were with him every day. They served with him. They ought to know there was nobody greater. Hallelujah. And so Jesus makes it clear that the greatest in the world is not based on power and public recognition. But Christ teaches us here that 
Spiritual greatness requires humility, sacrifice, and service. That's the greatness right there. You're not always opening your mouth. You're not always up making trouble. When you're not thinking you're the greatest of anyone, but you've got humility about you, that brings attention to you. You know, it's good for some folk to try to wonder what makes you tick. You don't always have to show people all the time what you have. Sometimes folk I don't have to wonder what was going on with that over there. Humility. Humility. The Lord has certain expectations of us as it relates to the kingdom of God. And perhaps God is saying, I'm not satisfied with where you are right now. <clears throat> Maybe God is saying, you are, I love this, that you are living beneath your privilege. Some of us are living beneath our privilege. We've got some privileges that has been made available to us by God. But we don't reach for them. We live beneath them. Why? Because we surely don't believe his word. Folks say they believe his word, but they really don't believe his word. We say we believe the word because it sounds good. And it makes us look deep. But when it really comes down to believing his word, don't let a storm come. Don't let a storm come. You won't even exercise your privileges that you have. Living beneath your privileges. And as I end my message, I'll come back and preach when I've got a voice. I'll come back one day. But as I end my message, I urge you to strive for quality people care. This is your next level of ministry. Quality people care. The church is all about people. Quality people care. Not just shabby people care, but when people walk in the door, they ought to know that you're for real about wanting them to be there. Amen. Be a people-oriented ministry. Strive for excellence. Care about your church property. We have babies. In life changing, we definitely don't have all of the facilities that we like to have for our children. So when I hear their voices, it makes me happy because it lets me know that the church is growing. It lets me know when I hear a baby cry that the, there's life in the church. And, and, and so I don't get hung up about hearing a child cry. I can preach through any baby cry. I'm real good at doing that. But if we've got small children, don't allow them to color the chairs. <laughs> Don't allow them to take a pen and take up the furniture. That's good. That's next level ministry. We need to care about our church property. We ought to care that there's paper on the floor. Doesn't matter who picks it up. Just pick it up. We ought to have radical hospitality. You ought to welcome others and make them know that you're glad to be with them. And you ought to have a caring curiosity. When you notice someone and they're really interested in connecting, that person knows it. Person knows when you really want them to connect with you. When they're coming to your church, they know whether or not you really want them to become part of the ministry. Why? Because you're going to go to them and make them welcome. You're going to go to them and love on them. You're going to go to them and find out where did you come from. Y'all don't hear me. And it's not about, I'm not that kind of, I don't have that kind of personality. Well, then if you got some fruit, you ought to have that person.
personality. Because the fruit of the Spirit will give you that kind of a personality. All right, don't tell me that you're a Christian and tell me I don't do stuff like that. Baby, you better go back and read what the fruit says. I hope I get to come back. When you know this, hallelujah, you got to be open to loving others, not looking down on them. Look past invisible differences and look past different attitudes and skin color and races. You got to look past all that stuff. That's radical hospitality. Jesus had radical hospitality. He had to respect a person. Ah, fuck were upset because he was sitting with the wine bibbers. Ah, but he sat with them and he laughed with them and he had conversation with them and they got to know him. And how will they get to know the God in you if you don't sit and talk to them? He sat with him and laughed with him and look at this one here. Uh, he went to visit Zacchaeus. Uh, he was a notorious cheater. Oh, uh, he would cheat the color on your skin. But Jesus went to visit with him uh, on Zacchaeus. Uh, and when he went to see him, uh, there was a miraculous change in him. Hallelujah. He had radical hospitality. Oh, when he went one night, uh, the Bible said that he went to see Nicodemus uh, one night, uh, and he went to see this man who didn't want to admit that he knew him, uh, but the Bible says he went at night, uh, but he went anyway, uh, but when he died, Nicodemus was right there, hallelujah, glory to God, he had radical hospitality, but on the cross, in his dying he said to a thief that didn't look like him, didn't do what he did, but he stood by him anyway. When the thief said to him, Lord, remember me when you get in paradise. He had radical hospitality. He told him today, not tomorrow, but when I get there today, and it's good to know you're going to get there. Jesus knew where he was going. He said, when I get there, I'm going to remember you on this day. Uh, you shall be with me in paradise. He had radical hospitality when he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. That's what you ought to be able to say. Somebody steps on you intentionally. You ought to say, Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. And so you're saying, but I'm not Jesus. But you got him in your baby. Because the word of God said, touch not my anointed and do my prophets no harm. So you better be careful when you mess with God's anointed. You better be careful how you treat your brother and your sister. You better be careful how you talk about them. Hallelujah. Glory to God. You ought to be able to do this. He had radical hospitality when he said, Father, into thy hands, I commend my spirit. Radical. Radical. So what does the next level church look like? Look at your neighbor and say, can I count on you? Can I count on you to make the next church go to the level it needs to be in Christ? You need to ask them. You need to ask her, but I didn't hear nobody say nothing. I had to get some yeses or some noes. Or whether or not you can be counted on to make the church be what God wants it to be. 
next level. Next level. So as we finish this anniversary, Pastor, I am sure, I am so sure that you're going to make it to the next 